Hi, so welcome back once again to Existential Psychology here at the University of West Georgia. We're in the midst of the uh, corona pandemic and because of that I haven't been able to get a haircut so my hair is growing increasingly long and uh, as a consequence I'd like to introduce a little something into this series of lectures which I like to think of as the ridiculous hat convention because it's getting so long that it's falling in my face as I'm trying to lecture to you. So here's the ridiculous hat of the day for this lecture. At any rate, uh, what we're going to do today is uh, go further into the myth of Sisyphus by the French Algerian existentialist Albert Camus. In our last video in this series, we were looking at uh, the myth of Sisyphus and more specifically at the idea of the absurd, which Camus regards as a kind of ontological category. That is a basic fundamental constituent of existence. So from that point of view, it's not just that life seems absurd and ridiculous and strange every now and then, as it well might these days in the midst of the corona vortex. It's because those kinds of experiences are only possible insofar as life is absurd in principle, at the ground level, at the root level. That's the real source of life's absurdity. Now, uh, Camus, in our last video, uh, localizes the central dimension of the absurd as a kind of tension between our desire to know what life is actually about where we came from, where we're going, if there's a point to it, if so, what is the point to it. That tension between our naturally having a kind of curiosity and desire to know the answers to these sorts of questions on one hand, and life's unreasonable silence on the other. He then gives us analysis of possible responses to the absurd, and he does so in terms of the theme of suicide. The question is, like, how can we be honest about how unreasonable and strange and weird life actually is? How can we be honest about all of that and still find a way of putting one foot front in front of the other and not committing suicide of one sort or another? Now, of one sort or another means that for him there are two basic types. First, there's suicide in its most literal form, but more commonly, there's a thing called philosophical suicide, which for Camus is basically has to do with shutting down our higher brain functions and curiosity about our desire to have answers for these questions, and instead accepting some kind of ready-made stopgap answers with respect to the fundamental questions that we all naturally have, such as what's the meaning of life? What is the meaning of life? Is there any purpose to it? Is there any purpose to our suffering? If so, what is it? So philosophical suicide, according to his analysis, uh, primarily takes the form of buying into belief systems that provide us with easy ready-made answers to the disturbing lack of answers to the fundamental questions of life. Religion, from his point of view, is uh, one of historically probably the most important and powerful mechanism by which we have committed philosophical suicide. But I tried to update that argument a little bit by pointing out that, well, there are secular ways of doing it too. For instance, uh, belief in an ultimately uh, rational, reasonable, scientific slash technological utopia could be a way of shutting down the disturbing lack of answers to life's most fundamental questions. Or, I think in our age, probably the most common thing has to do with uh, commodity and entertainment culture, which I think is a way of narcotizing ourselves a lot of the time uh, away from and numbing ourselves out with respect to the disturbing anxiety we might otherwise feel when we honestly confront how difficult and unreasonable and absurd life actually is. All that stuff from last time. So uh, in this lecture, in this video, what we're going to do is continue along the arc of Camus' analysis of the absurd, but this time, instead of dwelling again at that tension point between life's unreasonable silence on one hand and our longing for concrete answers on the other, he points out a bunch of other dimensions of the absurd. Although the tension between life's silence and our native curiosity he regards as the central dimension of the absurd. 
That would be an obvious test question when you think about it. Okay, so uh, some other dimensions that appear in the myth of Sisyphus. Okay, as you can see from the notes to the side, repetition and futility is a big part of what makes life absurd. Like when you're really honest about how repetitive a lot of life is, like how much of it is just variations on the same stuff that you've known your entire life or within the grander scope of things, uh, repetitions of the same stuff that humanity has been dealing with for centuries, millennia, eons even. Like, there's something kind of strange about that, like how repetitive life is, like how many unique moments, you ever wonder about how many sort of genuinely unique moments you actually experience in your life as opposed to how many moments are just variations of the same old stuff that you're used to in one way or another. And I think the honest answer to that is the vast majority of our lives are just variations on stuff that we've known and that we do every day. It's sort of like waking up. My own personal waking up ritual is sort of like, you know, I wake up, uh, I go to the bathroom, uh, I uh, brush my teeth, I take a shower, it's the same sort of thing. Every now and then I, I'll break out a new toothbrush or something like that. But um, for the most part, but there again, it's like, well, breaking out a new toothbrush isn't exactly a monumentally unique event because I've done it many thousands of times before. So uh, the dimension of absurdity is one of the things that makes our lives uh, absurd. Now, in that regard, he compares us to the classical figure from Greek antiquity, Sisyphus. And maybe you remember what happened to poor Sisyphus. So Sisyphus was a kind of lower order god who was condemned by the gods to a life of infinitely repetitive labor in the form of pushing a huge boulder up a mountain only to see it roll back down to the bottom of the mountain and then he'd have to go back down to the bottom of the mountain and push it up again. And he would have to do that infinitely because he was an immortal. He was a lesser god, therefore immortal. He would, his condemnation for displeasing the gods was infinite repetitive labor. Camus calls Sisyphus, this historical figure from antiquity, the proletarian of the gods. That's on page 121 of your book. So proletarian, of course, is a everyday worker, much like the vast majority of us are. I guess unless you're a Kardashian or a Paris Hilton or someone like that. Most of us are proletarians of one sort or another. And the point he's making is that if you're a regular everyday person, you're subject to the kind of condemnation that Sisyphus had to endure mythologically, like the structure of our lives is a lot like that kind of condemnation when you're honest about how much repetition, how much of the same there is. Nothing new under the sun, as it says in the Bible, like how much of that there really is in our lives. And probably I would say that, you know, more than 95 percent, probably more than 99 percent of our lives are just variations on stuff we've been through before. So in a way, he sees uh, our lives and our existence as a kind of condemnation to the absurd that's true, not only in the form of not getting the answers that we really long for and that would be reasonable, but with respect to how repetitive our lives actually are. So we, uh, Sisyphus is the proletarian of the gods and what I've done here in your notes is tried to illustrate that a little bit and uh, here is a kind of cartoon that maybe uh, sort of gets that across, you know, like how much of your day is really defined by a kind of circularity. And you may think, ah, but the weekend uh, is something different, right? Well, you've experienced weekends before, actually every weekend, although it seems to be a break from the circularity of your life, is actually just another weekend. It's just another form of circularity and maybe you think like well what happens when you go on vacation well you've been on vacations before too haven't you you know well what happens let's say when you graduate from college well that'll be sort of a unique and distinct moment in your life 
Really? You've never graduated from a school before? Because it's just another variation on the same thing and probably you've done it who knows how many number of times when you graduated from elementary school to junior high, when you graduated from junior high to high school, when you graduated from high school to college. Now when you graduate from college, let's say you go to graduate school, that'll be another repetition of the same thing. You know, or maybe uh, you'll get a job after you get your degree. Well, in a way, that will be a variation on the same thing, too. Once again, you'll find yourself the low person on the totem pole. There'll be a, a, a hierarchy already established, a bunch of rules already established. It'll probably be more like graduating from another school and then entering another school than it would be different from that. So the vast majority of our lives is full of all kinds of repetition or the corona the coronavirus well you know like if you get the coronavirus and you get sick well you've been sick before it's kind of like that um, you know well maybe you would be tempted to think well the kind of social situation in which we find ourselves like that's unique well not really when you look at it in historical terms the 1918 Spanish flu influenza epidemic uh, was much more deadly than the coronavirus seems to be, at least at this point. Um, but if you really want to sort of go back and, and uh, compare the coronavirus to something, maybe you could compare it to the Black Plague in the Middle Ages. And boy, you know, there, there was a plague. There was a pestilence worthy of that ancient word pestilence, almost a biblical type word. But at any rate, even the coronavirus you can see within the larger scope of things as being a repetition of another pathogen dominating humanity, killing us off and leaving the rest in an anxious state trying to survive. It's just the same game. It's just been a little while since we played it. It's been about a century since we played it. All right, so uh, now most of our lives are full of repetition. Now the other side of the condemnation of Sisyphus though is that his it's not just that his labor is repetitive. The other side of the condemnation is that it doesn't amount to anything. After all, he rolls the boulder up the mountain, he sees it rose, roll back down, he has to roll it up again infinitely. So it's not just the repetitive nature of it, it's the fact that his labor never amounts to anything. There's never a fulfillment of anything. There's never any uh, sort of meaning to it. It's meaningless. And so, uh, here too, Sisyphus, or not Sisyphus, but Camus finds that our lives are a lot like that. And at first it can be sort of a, a sort of harsh thing to realize that that's true. In your notes, I uh, sort of went on at some length, I can see, uh, about how you can see it that way. It's like, well, you know, what about your accomplishments? Like, even if your labor is highly repetitive, surely the fact that you accomplish something in your life would break it out of that seemingly uh, vengeful circularity uh, that Camus is suggesting that actually defines our lives. And, uh, well, you know, there's always a perspective from which even the greatest accomplishments shrinks into an infinitesimal insignificance. And uh, the, that perspective is actually the perspective of reality itself. Uh, for instance, from the perspective of reality, do you really think, let's say you have a real high grade average in college, do you think, and you graduate summa cum laude, <laughs> the highest sort of echelon of graduation during the graduation ceremony, do you really think that in a hundred years anyone will remember that fact? Anyone will know that? Anyone will, uh, it will matter to anyone in any way whatsoever? A hundred years is not a long time in historical terms, which in turn is not a long time with respect to geological time, which in turn is not a long time with respect to universal or cosmic time. So do you think in the short span of a hundred years that your incredibly luminous, powerful accomplishment will matter to anyone in any way whatsoever? And I think the answer is it won't. And neither will mine, by the way. So it's, a, it's an accomplishment. Do you think anyone in a hundred years will remember that I have a PhD or that I earned a PhD or four, four college degrees along the way, you know? No, I think would be the obvious answer. Probably in a hundred years no one will, will remember my name or anything about me or even my silly hat of the day gimmick during the coronavirus. Probably in a hundred years people won't remember the coronavirus at all. Um, 
And that's the way life is. Everything gets sort of uh, plowed under with time. Everything dissolves with time. That doesn't mean that life is, uh, you know, a bad thing or anything like that. It's just a way of deflating what would otherwise be our overweening hubris about uh, the significance of our accomplishments and what we do. In a hundred years, no, no one will remember whether you're a good person or a bad person. No one will re really remember what you're about in any way whatsoever. And if that's true in a hundred years, you can imagine how much more true it is in 500 or a thousand years, which once again is not a long period of time with respect to reality. The reality of the world we live in, by world I mean the universe, is that it's been around according to current scientific estimates uh, age of the known universe 13.7 billion years. Well that's kind of a long time to wait around for something. I don't know about you. I tend to get impatient after only a hundred thousand years if I have to wait for something like a, if I have to wait for like a traffic light for like even 10,000 years. To wait at a traffic light for 10,000 years, I don't know about you. I kind of start to get antsy at some point. So what's the point? The point is that like all of our accomplishments, all of our meanings, all of our values, everything we labor for, everything we care about, it's all going to be dissolved. It's all going away and it's going away pretty soon when you look at it from the point of view of reality itself. So from that point of view, all of, all of our accomplishments don't amount to anything either. A little bit like Sisyphus's condemnation. Well, at this point, because that can be such a, a difficult, bitter pill to swallow, it's uh, always tempting to defer the meaning of our lives onto something that exceeds the outer boundary of our life. Well, you know, in a hundred years they may have forgotten about me, but if I manage to have children in that time, and my children have children of their own and so on, then in a hundred years, in some sense, the meaning or significance of my existence will be perpetuated so that in a hundred years my descendants will be inhabiting the world and that'll make some kind of appreciable difference. And the obvious counter-argument there would be, well, you know, if, the, if it's not at all clear that all of your accomplishments and values and Herculean efforts to, to be a good person and so on, if it's not at all clear that all of that stuff has any enduring significance with respect to the universe in your lifetime, then why should you expect it to be any different for your children or for their children or for their children or for the human race as a whole for that matter? Why would you expect the universe to provide some kind of confirmation or affirmation of the significance of the entire human race over all that span of time? And of course the obvious, uh, I think, observation is that, well, you know, it doesn't. It simply doesn't. Uh, the fact, I think you know this, that the Earth itself, I think you know this because it's just part of modern uh, scientific cosmology, that the Earth itself will be destroyed in the current estimate around four to five billion years as the the sun goes through its expansion processes which is a natural part of the lifespan of stars like our own sun and eventually it'll expand out and engulf the earth itself so the earth itself is is going away and everything that happened on it will be dust eventually ashes to ashes dust to dust okay so the unpleasant truth is that all of our efforts are ultimately futile because life doesn't provide any confirmation of what we would think of as their significance or their importance. We're not that important. We're just not that important to the universe. We like to think we are, that's for sure. We like to think that we're essential and that we're the center of things. Uh, this was the problem that <laughs> Galileo ran into. In the, in the Middle Ages when he was asking the uh, prelates of the Catholic Church to look into his telescope to observe the moons of Jupiter. So he had this early telescope that he was able to observe uh, the moons orbiting around the planet Jupiter. And the reason why that was so damn significant is that, well, you know, it disproved the idea that everything revolves around the Earth because up till that point in time it was a matter of religious orthodoxy that everything had to revolve around the Earth. Well, why does everything have to revolve around the Earth? Because we're here. 
And it's like, well, you know, <laughs> we're not that important. We're not the center of life, the universe, and everything. In fact, the reality is that, you know, the universe could probably just wipe us away in an instant if it decided to. Who knows? It might come up with a disease, kind of difficult disease for our scientists to manage, one that propagates itself across uh, the populace rather rapidly and uh, has unpredictable effects with respect to its severity and causes people to go into various sorts of uh, anxiety-driven panics and lockdowns of various sorts. Purely hypothetical example, but hey, Use your imagination, or better yet, look around. Okay, so, so the point is that our lives, a little bit like Sisyphus, are full of lots of repetitive activity. There's no affirmation coming from life itself that all of our labors, all of our efforts have any sort of significance whatsoever. In fact, if you look at reality itself, it seems to provide a disconfirmation of that. The universe would probably, you know, annihilate us with a random asteroid like it seemingly did to the dinosaurs, according to one theory. Like, the universe will get rid of us, we're not the center of things, we're not that important, and so on. But that doesn't yet make our lives a kind of condemnation. Important point. What makes our lives a condemnation is the fact that we can be conscious of that. Dramatic silence. Okay, now, because when you think about it, a lot of the animal kingdom, their lives operate according to a very repetitive, cyclical, uh, futile logic too. It's like a lot of animals' lives are, well, you're born, you grow up, you try to mate, you live the rest of your life, and then you die. The next generation is born, it tries to mate, it lives the rest of its life, and then it dies, and so on and so on and so on. This is, this is an obvious point if you watch nature specials with any frequency, like how repetitive it really is. Um, the thing about animals, as far as we know, is that they're not conscious of the circularity of their lives. They are not aware of how it doesn't really add up to anything, not only with respect to kind of their everyday existence, but with respect to these larger historical arcs, like, um, you know, uh, dogs and cats, let's say, uh, seemingly aren't aware that, well, you know, all of dogdom and all of catdom, all of their accomplishments, all of their attempts to get into the cat food or the dog food and so on, don't actually amount to anything from the point of view of reality. But they don't experience, seemingly, as far as we know, we, they don't experience their lives as a kind of condemnation, a kind of absurd condemnation, in the same way we do. Well, why is that? Because they seemingly don't have that reflective capacity to know, to be able to be aware enough of their lives and the structure of their lives so that the repetitive and futile nature of it could be something they can be consciously aware of and being consciously aware of it, they can agonize about it. Let me turn my phone off for a second. Actually, I'm going to edit that out because I think it's my wife. Hello. All right. So, sorry about that. That was uh, my wife. Um, all right. So, uh, what was the point? The point is that what makes the, the repetitive and futile nature of our existence a kind of condemnation is not just the bare, repetitive, and futile nature of it. To make it a kind of condemnation, you have to be aware of it. You have to be aware of it before you can agonize over it, before it can become something uh, painful, something difficult for us. Because if you're never aware of it, you'll just kind of continue on with the circularity of your existence, much the same way that animals seemingly do. So our consciousness is really uh, part of the absurd. The fact that we're conscious is part of what makes our existence an absurd thing in a way that it does not seem to be particularly absurd for animals. Animals don't seem to be going around, uh, you know, sort of <laughs> engaging in philosophical suicide for one thing and uh, ruminating over what to do about it and ruminating uh, over how difficult it is to be caught in the vicious circularity of life and the futility of life and the fact that life doesn't provide any concrete or definite confirmation of 
our desires for accomplishment or anything else that we would code as something meaningful. Okay, so uh, maybe uh, let's see if that's enough for one lecture. Maybe it is. Okay. Once again, <laughs> thanks for being along for the ride, uh, both with respect to this class and with respect to the larger ride of trying to do these lectures uh, via the internet and uh, the larger ride yet of life and all of its absurdity. Speaking of uh, the absurd in life, boy, I think the coronavirus is really giving us a sense. If you haven't figured it out yet, look around, check out what's happening, check out your own feelings and worries and anxieties and so on and so forth, and ask yourself in the spirit of Camus analysis, could it be the case that ultimately all of that is ultimately an expression of life's fundamental absurdity and unreasonableness. And in a way, the problem is not the coronavirus itself. The real plague is nothing less than our lives. Have a nice day.